welcome to this program entitled Addressing Pandemic Impacts and Resilience on Vulnerable Populations and International Comparison. This program is proposed by the UR Life Graduate School. This is a program part of the series Health Economics, Vulnerable Populations and Mental Health in Time of Crisis. I am Lina Penagos, political scientist and the UR Life project manager. Today, I have the great pleasure to have with us Thomas Barnet, professor in economics at Erudit Unit of Research, visiting professor at Harvard University, and also Thomas Martinez, his pharmacist, PhD candidate in health economics and UR Life Health. The educational goals of these programs are first, to analyze the pandemic impacts on health and well being over vulnerable populations from an international comparative approach in Europe, France, and the USA. Second, to provide meaningful insight into the effects of COVID-19 on mental health and immunopressed populations. Third, to introduce the concept of health vulnerability and resilience and their application to the COVID-19 crisis. And finally, to identify new vulnerable populations and stress the need to develop new transdisciplinary researchers in the field. Thank you very much for being with us today. And the first question that I would like to address is to Thomas Barnet. Thomas, how has the pandemic affected populations in, a in an heterogeneous way within an international approach? Thank you, Lina, for asking me this very relevant question. Actually, thanks to the amazing work coming from the John Hopkins University, along with Oxford University, we are able to figure out the signs of this pandemic in terms of prevalence, incidence, or death, but also government responses as regards stringency and vaccine policies. Therefore, to highlight international differences, I use several graphs and select a few developed countries, such as United States, France, United Kingdom, Germany, Japan, and so on. I assume that's one of the most appropriate indicators able to stress the direct effect of outbreak is the number of deaths. This first bar chart represents the cumulative confirmed COVID-19 deaths per million people in order to control for population size. And we can observe that the most be bereaved countries since the beginning of the crisis are respectively the United States, Italy, and UK. France ranks in an intermediate position at the same level as Spain, but far beyond Germany. In order to tackle this outbreak, countries have been putting in place restriction measures since March 2020. In December 2021, due to the evolution of the variant data and the emergence of Omicron, these measures have been reactivated as shown in this second graph. It points out the stringency index, which is a composite measure taking into account school closures, workplace closures, and travel bans, rescaled to a value from zero to 100 for the strictest situation. Thus, the most restrictive policies are currently being pursued by Germany, Italy, and France, due to the high level of the resurgence of the virus during this fifth wave. Apart from restriction policies, the main response to the virus is naturally vaccination. However, the availability of vaccines, communication and health promotion policies, management of the delivery of vaccines, as well as vaccine hesitancy, um, explain the gap between countries. This new graph displays the rates of fully vaccinated population. It goes from 60% in the United States to 80% in Spain. On average, in Europe, it does not even reach 60%, which is very low. Due to the loss of vaccine effectiveness after six months, and the mutation of the virus, several countries have implemented a third dose. Israel was the first country to introduce the third dose, so-called booster, in August 2021. And as underlined in this bar chart, in Israel, 44% of the population received the booster, 
versus 28% in UK and only 12% in France. Finally, I would like to show um, a last curve concerning the evolution of an employment rate from early 2020 to the second quarter of 2021. It may be relied on labor market structure, but also economic responses in terms of supporting firms and self-employed and debt or contract relief. After lockdown, we observe an increase in an employment rate in all countries, sometimes with a very huge drop as in the United States. Some countries have already succeeded in restoring an unemployment rate identical to the pre-crisis period or even lower. This is the case for Germany and France. For others, the increase in unemployment has not been absorbed as in Spain and in the United States. And we know that is a powerful vector of health inequalities between countries. Thank you, Thomas. This is very interesting what you said, particularly regarding an important vector in the consequences. I would like to move forward to Thomas Martinez. Your professional career is very transdisciplinary, if I may say. You're a pharmacist and also you're doing a thesis in health economics founded by the UR Life Program. Your current research is focused on the concept of resilience in the context of both health and economic crisis. I have two questions for you. First of all, what do you mean by resilience in health? And second, why it is important to do research on this concept, particularly in a time of crisis? Thank you, Lina. First of all, what is resilience? The word comes from the Latin resilere, meaning to rebound, to bounce back. Metaphorically, it implies that one has fallen from a height and manages to get back there, and even sometimes higher. What does not kill me makes me stronger, said Nietzsche. But to be more modest, more lucid, let's say that being resilient implies at least uh, not being crushed by an adversity. Why specify health resilience? Well, because resilience can be applied to other aspects of people's lives, such as the economic aspects, as well as to other aspects, other systems. Some researchers would be interested, for example, uh, by the economic trajectory of companies uh, following a crisis. We can thus precise that we are studying health resilience, which can relate to both mental and physical health. It seems important also to point out that there is no real consensus on its definition, but the one I prefer, the, the, most, rigorous one, the, the most rigorous one, in my opinion, applied to health, refers to a process, uh, meaning a set of actions and operations uh, carried out at any scale that promotes uh, a better than expected uh, health outcomes following uh, an adversity. The term better than expected seems important to me because uh, it can be difficult to talk about um, good outcomes uh, following adversities. It may be more rigorous to, to use the term better, but better than what? That is the question. Uh, this means having a reference and this reference can be absolute, uh, for example, if an adversity is expected to be uh, to significantly increase the number of depressive, de depressive symptoms, then individuals who do not experience uh, an increase of a given number of symptoms could be called resilience, resilient. But the problem with arbitrarily setting a resilience threshold is that it lacks precision. In this case, individuals are either resilient or not. It can therefore be preferable to have a, a, a relative uh, reference. Uh, it may be more informative to consider individuals to be more or less resilient. An individual is more resilient than another if his health is less deteriorated uh, by an, an adversity. Studying health resilience means identifying uh, those who fare better 
and trying to understand uh, why this is the case. And two things uh, can explain these heterogeneities, inequalities in resilience capacity and differences in individual preferences. And if we believe in free will, this distinction refers to the idea that an individual can have great potential, in this case, a great resilience capacity, but not fully express it. In this case, not uh, achieving the expected health trajectory uh, following a given adversity. And we can often blame preferences uh, for this discordance. But if we focus on resilience capacity, it is determined by a, a specific combination of characteristics, both individual and uh, contextual. For the individual characteristics that may contribute to resilience capacity, we can cite, for example, age, gender, education, genetics, and past events. For contextual characteristics, we can speak of the quality uh, and generosity of the social protection system, but also the relevance and speed of implementation of certain public policies. Um, by studying health resilience, we hope to promote the implementation of better targeted and more appropriate uh, public policies and thus help reduce the vulnerability of individuals. Indeed, vulnerability um, to a hazard, etymologically the capacity to be wounded uh, by a hazard, can be seen as the product of uh, the probability of being exposed uh, to a hazard and that and the probability of um, a given adverse event uh, as a result of this exposure. For example, regarding COVID, um, an individual who is comorbid but has a very low probability of exposure, for example, because uh, he works uh, at home and uh, in the countryside, uh, is certainly less vulnerable than an individual who is healthier, but at much greater risk of exposure to the virus. For example, uh, living in a city and having a job at the front line, for example. So to reduce the vulnerability, we can act upon the probability of exposure and resilience capacity. And the interest in resilience is all the more reinforced when the adversity considered is difficult to predict or avoid. And this is the case of the recent crisis, the 2008 economic crisis, for example, and the COVID-19 crisis. And um, they provide uh, this crisis a, a relevant framework for, for studying resilience. Uh, the idea is that if we cannot really limit the probability of exposure uh, to uh, stresses uh, in, induced by this crisis, we can act uh, upon uh, on the resilience capacity of individuals to reduce their vulnerabilities. Definitely, pandemic underlines the need to strengthen research in resilience. So let's go back to Thomas Barnet. Thomas, with health measures, including several lockdowns, we can mostly expect to have significant consequences on mental and psychological health. So what do we really know about the effect of the pandemic, uh, of the pandemic on the mental health of population? Oh, then there is um, a very prolific literature demonstrating adverse effects of COVID-19 COVID and containment on mental health and well-being. Generally speaking, social isolation uh, increases the risk of mental health problems and an increase in anxiety, depression and other negative feelings are connected with the financial difficulties and economic downturn associated um, with the pandemic and resulting from isolation policies. Among elderly, we know that the level of depression, but also, of course, of loneliness is higher than prior to the pandemic. Then uh, let's move to a uh, source of heterogeneity and inequalities. Um, first of all, gender inequalities have been amplified during 
COVID-19. Um, women are, are more economically vulnerable to COVID-19 outbreak. First, um, as contrary to economic recessions, which affect men's employment more severely than women's employment, the employment drop related to COVID-19 measures has a large impact on sectors with high female employment shares. Next, school closure and daycare centers have massively increased childcare needs, which has a particularly large impact on working mothers. Uh, women spending significant more time homeschooling and caregiving uh, for children. And um, finally, this division of childcare is associated with a reduction of working hours and an increased probability of transitioning out of employment. Parenting during the crisis resulted in significant cognitive overload. Psycho uh, psychological distress symptoms peaked in April 2020 with mother of school-aged children in the household presenting the highest rates of uh, psychological distress. Women with uh, school-aged children in the household experience, experienced a higher probability of psychological distress than those without children. And this effect is driven by elementary uh, school age or younger children in the household. And my last point um, concerns racial and ethnic health disparities. We have many evidence uh, all over the world, but in especially in the US. First and foremost, there is an over mortality for Hispanic, Latino, Black, and Indian or Alaska Native people in the US. Secondly, depressive symptoms and fear of COVID-19 are more prevalent among racial and ethnic minority population. And thirdly, symptoms of adverse mental or behavioral health conditions were more common among Hispanic and non-Hispanic Black people compared with non-Hispanic white people. So we can see that actually the effect is very broad. I would like to ask you, Thomas Martinez, uh, about these inequalities. Um, in this ongoing health crisis, what lesson offer uh, the research in mental health, well-being and resilience over health trajectories? To, to answer this question, it is necessary to insist that uh, on the fact that studying resilience implies comparing individuals facing similar adversity. And this is not the case for most studies on the determinants of mental health and well being trajectories during the COVID 19 crisis. Indeed, most studies to date have considered the crisis as one uniform adversity for everyone. The problem, of course, is that not all individuals have, have had the same experience of the crisis. They differ not only in the adversities encountered, but also in their intensity. For example, the conditions of confinement were not the same for everyone. Uh, some lived alone, uh, others in overcrowded housing. Uh, some had to work uh, and take care of children at the same time, while others did not face that problem. The problem is that if we seek uh, to study the effect of uh, characteristics, say income, for example, um, on the resilience of individuals, and we do not compare individuals uh, with similar adversity, then the estimated effect will be biased uh, if income is correlated with the intensity of the adversity, since the effect will therefore capture both the probability of exposure to this adversity and resilience capacity, so vulnerability in general and not only resilience capacity. So it is unclear whether the individuals who fare worst uh, were those who were the most severely exposed to stresses or those who exhibited uh, the least resilience. And making the difference is uh, matters because um, the determinants of exposure are not necessarily the same as those of resilience. 
In a recently published paper, Johnston et al. tried to take into account uh, this heterogeneity in adversity uh, encountered during the COVID-19 crisis uh, in the UK. They distinguished three shocks, a financial shock, a health shock, a social support shock, and compared individuals who are similar on key social demographic and economic characteristics and who were therefore likely to have had a relatively similar experience of the first confinement. They find that financial resources did not affect individuals' psychological resilience following these shocks, nor do cognitive abilities, religiosity, and neighbor social capital. Only self-efficacy was protective uh, against psychological distress uh, following large earning shocks. But a study, another study published earlier, found that a similar measure of self-efficacy was not associated with a reduction of the effects of unemployment on, on psychological distress. So um, although the measures and methodology of, the, of both articles were not the same, we may hypothesize that the determinants of resilience uh, can differ by population, adversity, and country. But beyond uh, these two papers, studies on resilience in the context of the COVID are still scarce, and we lack perspective. So what we can do is looking at the broader literature on health resilience. And the good news is that it tends to teach us that most individuals confronted with uh, different types of adversity are not excessively impacted uh, by it and recover or adapt generally quickly. In a recently published uh, article, Etile et al. Uh, distinguish on Australian data three classes profiles uh, of psychological response uh, following a standard event um, that was constructed from a set of uh, adversities that individuals may have encountered. And they observe that even for class three, the least resilient one there is a return to psychological uh, level after a significant decrease the year of the event. And among the protective factors of resilience, they found that the fact of being a man, uh, having a higher cognitive ability, being extroverted and being older. On the other hand, individuals with a lower social background and poor childhood health showed less resilience. To finish with this small overview introduction of the resilience literature, we can look at the determinants of health trajectory following adversities encountered uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, such as the loss of a spouse uh, and unemployment. And the literature suggests, in contrast to the, to the work I've just mentioned, uh, that men's health suffers more in the face of these uh, adversities. Interestingly, it appears uh, overall that social capital and social economic status do not have much of an impact on resilience to these adversities, but perhaps the measures available are not always sufficiently uh, informative. Um, however, it appears that people living in southern countries suffer more from the loss of uh, a spouse and, and countries with a more general social protection system mitigate the negative effect of unemployment. Finally, depending on the richness of the data, it is possible to identify less standard determinants, uh, such as immigration status, childhood living conditions, region of residence, and personality traits. Thank you, Thomas Martin, for this very interesting uh, review of our literature related with health resilience. I was wondering, Thomas Barnet, how does your personal work research fit into the broad literature or the relationship between the COVID and the mental health crisis? Thank you so much to give me the opportunity to talk about this research. My research conducted in the healthcare policy department of Harvard Medical School with Joseph Newhouse and Richard Frank is to measure the impact of COVID-19 on depression, loneliness, and sleeping problems among 50 and older population in Europe and in the US. Um, I want to disentangle direct and indirect effects. Direct effects 
include fear of the pandemic itself and also effects of closure and containment measures. And on the other side, indirect effects are related to the consequences of measures implemented to limit the pandemic, and especially in terms of employment, loss of wealth, and foregone care. Uh, I also want to analyze individual level, such as age, gender, employment, uh, experience, personal experience of COVID-19, and country level variables, uh, such as intensity of pandemic, testing policy, contact tracing, fast recoverings, and stringency index. This is the, um, the, the outline of my research. And uh, to do that, I use three databases allowing to gather information relative to 28 countries and representing 40,000 individuals aged 50 and over. At this stage, I use two waves, one before COVID-19 in 2018, and one conducted during summer 2020, so after the first wave of COVID. Um, in a methodological point of view, I perform a simple econometric me method model called ordinary least square. Here are the, the first very preliminary findings. As regards individual effects, we can notice that depression, loneliness, and sleep disorders are higher among women. Depression, sleep disorders, feeling of loneliness, and bad perceived health are positively correlated as is expected. Age decreases the feeling of depression, but increases the feeling of loneliness. And being in a couple, this is due to uh, children, increases depression and decreases the feeling of loneliness. Secondly, the role of mental health before COVID-19 appears to be crucial in order to explain mental health during COVID-19. Fatigue, uh, depression, and loneliness in 2018 increases post-COVID mental health problems. On the contrary, feeling happy in 2018 limits the feeling of loneliness post-COVID. Concerning COVID-19 experiences, being positively tested and the death of a loved one due to COVID-19 amplify depression. Hospitalization due to COVID-19 has no effect on depression, but on women's feeling of loneliness. Foregone care due to lockdown increases the feeling of depression. And among people not in employment, the negative effect of foregone care is confirmed on depression and on loneliness as well. Of course, losing a job increases depression. Finally, after controlling for individual characteristics, country level variables play a significant role on mental health problems. For instance, living in a country with a high COVID-19 death per million people increases depression, but full contact tracing tends to reduce depression. Mass policies increase depression and loneliness, but decrease depression in employed people. And finally, more stringency policy increases the feeling of loneliness. Indeed, a very promising research with many variables in a transdisciplinary way. Thank you very much, Thomas Barnet. Thomas Martinez, uh, what do you see for uh, your future work on this issue? On COVID-19 crisis, um, given the short time span that we have, I would mainly study mental health resilience. Uh, as for physical health resilience, the consequences of a much longer term, we can already look at the heterogeneous effects of the crisis on healthcare consumption and risk behaviors, which can significantly uh, affect future health. In, in other words, it is a matter of identifying the processes, the pathways uh, through which health resilience operates. This aspect of resilience research, which is still under-researched, 
uh, calls for interdisciplinarity uh, as uh, the, the processes may involve several aspects of the individual's lives and, and also different systems. We could uh, also focus on specific, uh, particularly vulnerable populations, such as the young or the elderly, to prevent uh, heterogeneity specific to these populations from being masked by the inclusion of a sample representing the whole population. Ideally, I intend to work on French data especially since we are fortunate enough to have uh, today a large uh, nationally representative annual court uh, that is very rich in information and notably on uh, the experience of the COVID-19 crisis, the Constance uh, Court. It has the originality and the advantage of matching uh, survey data with administrative data, which is kind of a grail uh, for any court. Thank you very much. Let's move forward to introduce Franz Piren. She has identified in the suppressed populations as one of the most vulnerable facing COVID-19. Why so? What does the experience of the French blood establishment producing hyperneoplasmas indicate to science and society, particularly to overcome vulnerabilities within pandemics and afterward? Let's take a look at the following video. This presentation is about transfusion of plasma from COVID convalescent donors in a specific vulnerable patient to COVID, the patient with uh, immunosuppression. So passive immunotherapy to treat infectious disease have been known for a very long time. The first one to use this concept was Adolf von Bering, a German physiologist who received the Nobel Prize. Uh, and if, oh, he was the first one awarded in that field for his discovery of diphtheria antitoxin and the demonstration that such antitoxin could allow for the transfer of anti-infectious immunity. So this concept has been used many times. Uh, for an example, uh, the antibody against hepatitis B are collected from plasma from uh, individuals, the same thing for tetanus, diphtheria, or CMV virus. So passive immunotherapy to treat infectious disease, uh, there is this possibility now of convalescent plasma treatment. Uh, with convalescent plasma treatment, you bring to the patient passive polyclonal antibody to provide immediate immunity. And it has been used to improve survival rate of patients with a severe acute respiratory syndrome of viral etiology. And a number of convalescent plasma studies, unfortunately, not all controlled for bias, have been reported, including decreased mortality in the so-called Spanish influenza in the 1915, and the more, the more recent influenza A, H1N1, and also the uh, SARS-CoV from the 2003 uh, epidemic. So convalescent plasma was unfortunately uh, not found to provide benefits for the treatment of Ebola disease. And uh, at the very beginning of uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, all the community of uh, transfusion uh, decided to uh, collect uh, plasma from convalescent individuals to treat patients. And here you have the first report in June showing, June 2020, showing that convalescent plasma therapy uh, in, gives some clinical improvement in patients with severe and life threatening COVID 19. <clears throat> So, in fact, convalescent plasma therapy brings passive immunotherapy. The antibodies that an individual produces have many effects on the virus. Different mechanisms are shown, such as virus neutralization, antibody-dependent virolysis, antibody-mediated presentation of antigen, or antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity. But the antibody that we bring with the convalescent plasma therapy has mainly a virus neutralization effect. So this is the way it works. So patients who got COVID uh, 
20 days after the resolution of the symptom, we can collect plasma by the apheresis techniques. And with one collection of plasma, we can uh, provide three doses of plasma of 200 milliliters. This plasma is treated by uh, pathogen attenuation by amotosalen. At that time, we didn't know if the virus was present in the plasma. So it was important to treat for pathogen attenuation the plasma that we were collecting. But in fact, the virus uh, is not transmi transmissible by transfusion. And after that, on the donor, we perform all the mandatory analyses that are required, plus additional measurement of the uh, concentration of the anti-SARS-CoV-2 in the plasma. So very soon, because it was not like a regular treatment, it was important to add the uh, uh, the possibility to uh, transfuse this plasma to the patient. Then the uh, regu the, the regulatory body, the ANSM, um, give these protocols and uh, we could treat the patient uh, with this protocol. It was the transfusion of two plasma of 200 milliliters at day zero and two plasma of 200 milliliters at day one with a 24-hour interval between the two transfusions. Then we try to give plasma from four different donors. Why? Because like that, we, we got a mixture of all the immune response of the, of the different donors. It was better that, than to give only the immune response of one donor. And the decision to transfuse has to be made by an independent committee of experts called Réunion de Concertation Pluridisciplinaire. So, very soon also, uh, at the beginning of 2021, there was this, um, this uh, study, and we, were, we feel a little bad by the result of the study because it was a very big international study, and with many, many patients transfused with therapeutic plasma, they show that there was no significant differences on survival between patients receiving standard care and patients receiving plasma therapy. However, the difference with our patient is that uh, in this very big cohort of patients, 62% of the patients had antibodies. But in France, we have treated only a particular vulnerable population, those who cannot produce the antibodies because of their disease or because of the treatment received that destroy all, uh, the cell that at produce, that produce, that differentiate in cells that produce the antibodies, the B cells. Then as COVID plasma, at the beginning, we transfused plasma to all patients, like in these international studies, but as COVID plasma were transfused, uh, the indication were refocused on patients with B lymphocyte deficiency, B lymphopenia, or anti-CD20 treatment, all patients who could not naturally produce antibodies. They always had negative SARS-CoV-2 serology. And in this first paper that we published, we show uh, the effect, the beneficial effect of plasma therapy in this, only in this type of patient. They do not have any um, gamma globulin, they did not have B lymphocyte, those uh, cells that at least produced the uh, antibodies. And they, however, they had uh, effective T cell response. So in this study, we had 17 patients with B cell lymphomia, uh, lymphopenia, sorry, and prolonged COVID-19 symptoms, but all negative for the serology. And they had also, for some of them, the virus present in their plasma. And after the transfusion, within 48 hours, they show a striking improvement of clinical symptoms in 16 out of 17 patients. All 10 oxygen-dependent patients could be weaned from the oxygen mask or non-invasive ventilation. So, uh, and SARS-CoV-2 uh, presence in the plasma decreased to below the sensitivity result in nine among nine evaluated patients. So here are all the parameters that were measured during, uh, after, before and after the treatment with plasma. Uh, the temperature, for example, that decreased in almost all patients. 
So the parameter showing the inflammation before uh, transfusion, such as uh, ferritin, CRP, uh, and interleukin-6, they all decrease uh, in, the, uh, in the patient treated. So finally, uh, at that time, we, we could use plasma therapy for this specific indication. Here you have all the indication of the different treatment depending on the phase of the disease. And plasma therapy uh, is used, in fact, uh, at the beginning of the disease, but not too late because when patients are very severe, they had this um, uh, very big inflammation and it's too late because they are already organ failure. It's too late with the antibodies. So we, it's better to use the plasma therapy at the beginning of the symptom and uh, for mild or moderate illness. So uh, since May 2020, when we begin this plasma therapy and the collection of plasma, we have treated about uh, 1,100 patients. And uh, most of the patients have, have been treated in the Parisian area but also in the Rhone Alps. So uh, you can see that uh, we had these different uh, waves of um, the virus. And in fact, uh, depending on the, the time between May um, 2020 and November 21, you can see that at some moment we had to transfuse many, many patients. And at other moment when we were, when it was between two waves, we did not have any uh, transfusion of the patient. So what can we say? We can say that uh, plasma therapy from, uh, plasma uh, obtained from uh, individual uh, convalescent for COVID uh, is an efficient therapy for immunosuppressed patients before uh, the arrival of production of monoclonal antibodies. Because now uh, on the market, we have the monoclonal antibodies and it is the reason, and at the beginning it was not produced, uh, that's the reason plasma therapy was so important, but now we have the monoclonal antibody that increase in their indication and we have less and less patients who are treated with plasma. So we have shown here an example of the rapid availability of convalescent plasma to treat a population vulnerable to COVID. Patients cannot produce anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibody because of their underlying pathology. Definitely we have identified a very interesting population in the press population, very vulnerable facing to COVID-19, as we did before with Tomas Martinez. This was a very interesting presentation. Let's see what Franz Piren can say, particularly uh, regarding the lessons learned from COVID-19. Among uh, COVID patients, some have, uh, are very vulnerable because they have comorbidity. So the population I spoke about, they have one specific comorbidity, they are unable to produce their own antibody. So at the beginning of the epidemic, we found very quickly a medication for those patients. It was the plasma from uh, convalescent donor, and now we have these monoclonal antibodies. However, we have always for this vulner specific vulnerable patient to continue to produce new treatment to adapt this monoclonal antibody from the new, new variant, we just cannot stay right now and say, oh, we got the monoclonal and it's okay for this patient. Because when we see the evolution of the epidemic, it's really something uh, the uh, scientific community have to work on. Uh, and it's maybe the same for all the other type of comorbidity in COVID-19. <music> Thank you, Franz. Uh, we have seen uh, this experience uh, regarding this vulnerable population, and I would like to go back to you, Thomas Barnet. Uh, from your experience, do you identify any particular, any new particularly vulnerable population? And furthermore, can public policies address the needs of vulnerable population within the heterogeneity of health trajectories? Huge question. Um, I think this crisis has generated two forms of vulnerability. Pre-existing vulnerabilities that have increased 
And as you noticed, new forms of vulnerability. In the first category, the most precarious populations, such as people over 65 years old with comorbidity, but also the youngest with obesity in particular, and the poorest have been directly affected, either because they have contracted serious forms of COVID-19 or have died, unfortunately, or because they have had to postpone care, which has fastly deteriorated, deteriorated uh, their physical and mental health. Among the public health priorities in this category, we should pay special attention to the follow-up of obese people and people in long-term COVID-19. In the second category, new forms of vulnerability, um, the follow-up of children and teenagers must be a national public health priority. The literature shows how painful events in childhood affect the entire life course in terms of health, but also in terms of professional career, not only in the short term. Um, I think that's the human capital deficit related to the poor learning of basic skills must be offset by a comprehensive long-term health policy focus on this population. Among all the forms of new vulnerability, we need to conduct studies on mothers of young children to assess and monitor their health status. Finally, um, the impact of this crisis on the way to work and health impact will be major. In particular, constraints, remote work will increase psychosocial risk at work and problems in balancing private and professional life with consequences on mental health. Studies on this subject will have to be carried out. So we have a research program for at least uh, the next 10 years. Definitely. We have really seen many interesting things and it's very interesting to see how women have been impacted and also children and also teenagers. So there's a lot of things to do. We have reached the end of the uh, program entitled Addressing Pandemic Impacts and Resilience on Vulnerable Populations, an international comparison proposed by the Live Graduate School. Do not forget to see in our website the next AUR Live Grant Calls for Masters in June and for PhD in May. You have all the information on our website and in the email address eur slash live at epec.fr. Thank you for being with us and see you in the next TV program.